I'd like to thank you everyone for um, for coming to the presentation today. Uh, the, the topic today is the cost of neglecting to invest in mental health. According to the uh, World Health Organization, uh, mental health is a state of well-being in which enables a person to cope with the stresses of life, learn and work well and contribute to their community. 12.5% uh, of people worldwide have a mental health disorder. Uh, which can include anxiety, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, PTSD, neurodevelopmental disorders, and dissocial disorders. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, 43.7% uh, of people have had a mental health issues in their life. 21.4% uh, have had a mental illness for over 12 months. Uh, according to the Australia, Australian Productivity Commission, community mental health issues cost around uh, $180 billion per year in Australia. Uh, much of this is spent on mental health related suicide and disability. And even this doesn't meet uh, community expectations. Uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, over hundred billion pounds is spent on mental health issues annually. I uh, just want to um, mention before uh, going further that this uh, presentation is looking at the global north and not the global south, uh, largely looking at how uh, mental health affects wealthy developed countries, uh, including Australia, but also Europe and North America in particular. Um, according to one psychiatrist uh, in a recent study, uh, the global north has a limited epistemological approach in addressing mental health. This is through the prism of neoliberalism with a fixation on economic interest and individuality, whereby um, biological, experiential and individual personality factors are posited as most significant. Whilst this has relevance and significance, the uh, Global South epistemology has been little understood by contrast, and the uh, North can benefit from that approach. So the Global South ha has both retained many traditional cultural uh, standards, as well as having adopted approaches to deal with uh, many of the structural issues caused by things like uh, slavery, colonialism, uh, including neo-colonialism, uh, and comparative uh, political and economic inequality. Uh, one key point of difference is highlighting the importance of the political and social in addressing mental health and how interdependence is a key theme with this viewpoint. Uh, while this can be relevant to the North, it highlights the shortcomings of its uh, epistemological approach and how different strategies are therefore needed uh, in the wealthy developed world. So another number of uh, strategies can be used to, to, uh, to try to uh, mitigate and address mental health issues, uh, as mentioned here, and we'll go through each one of those. Um, to begin with, um, one of the important backdrops to enabling mental health, uh, positive mental health outcomes within, uh, within a community is, as many studies have shown, is access to uh, green, uh, green areas, uh, conservation areas, um, unused green spaces like parks, et cetera. Uh, so green cities are, are an important aspect of uh, enabling mental health, uh, positive mental health outcomes to occur. Uh, alongside that uh, community participation programs for elderly people and as well as those with mental illness can actually assist in mental health also. Um, this can link to things such as um, subsidized volunteering. Uh, if we look at countries, um, uh, many Western and Northern European countries, as well as Australia and the UK, we have uh, social welfare systems for people who, particularly often, who may be disadvantaged, but who uh, can't get work. Um, uh, this has a double-edged sword when we, when we talk about um, uh, volunteering or, or, or subsidised volunteering. Um, in, one, in one way, it can facilitate uh, engaging for, for people who otherwise might be socially isolated, whereas the other um, approach is that if it's seen as mandating people to work if they are otherwise disadvantaged and can't gain work, um, it can be very disempowering. It can have an empowering approach when it promotes a freedom and choice to contribute, where if they are on welfare, if they cannot contribute uh, to the economy, uh, if, the, if, it, if they feel as though they are, they've got the capacity to try and deliver back to society but aren't mandated to, it can have a positive uh, mental health outcome. Uh, the promotion of work, mental wellbeing in school systems is vital as a means of ensuring mental health uh, through utilising uh, universalised approaches, as can be seen in, in uh, Europe uh, in a recent case study. Um, mental health issues in children account for 13% of the entire global burden of disease in children. 
uh, curriculum-based approaches focused on shaping emotional and social competence can assist to decrease virtual future mental health expenditure. So it seeks to mitigate what may uh, eventuate um, as uh, mental health costs in the future. And when we talk about work, workplace wellbeing, so positive work-life balance is important uh, for mental wellbeing. Uh, economic factors are significant, therefore, and links to the, spe the perspectives of the Global South, which aren't as heavily dependent on this, or historically so. Uh, too much work, not enough balance, and financial struggle is a counter, obviously, to mental wellbeing. Um, mindfulness in education and workplaces facilitates better mental health. It also prevents bullying and any toxic dynamics. Um, strategies at policy level to ensure on-site workplaces that do not enable psychosocial factors and workplace cultures which allow bullying are needed. And a few recent studies have highlighted how policy level oversight from, from management is needed in certain workplaces. Uh, particular workplaces are hospitality, uh, construction and the food industry where workplace bullying and mental distress is high. And there's been many, many case studies of, of these particular industries where, where it's most prominent uh, due to ineffective management. So there, there needs to be better oversight. Uh, at policy level, there's a requirement for counteracting both laissez-faire and authoritarian workplace structures. Um, authoritarian is, is clear, obviously, how that uh, manifests. Laissez-faire is where employers are left to deal with issues themselves, where worker distress and um, ineffective management is therefore allows bullying and, uh, and other ill treatment to occur. Uh, bullying in the workplace is actually cost uh, in a healthcare context uh, one trillion dollars uh, uh, in the United States per year. Um, that was regarding um, one particular industry. Uh, outside of yeah, education and, um, and work settings, we've got obviously um, mental health care and uh, people feeling that they can access mental health care um, when needed. Uh, in countries like Australia, there is usually free mental health care up following a GP referral, as in you can get uh, usually 10 uh, free counselling sessions following that. Um, in many other countries, there are other um, avenues of free uh, mental health care as well. Uh, this is important in enabling accessibility of mental health services. Um, and as part of mental health services and even in institutions and corrections, a follow-up of care patients and individuals within the community is vital as a means of transition. It's also important to highlight the commonality of mental illness and uh, the, the focus of mental health within the community so that's more broadly understood. Mental wellbeing by country. So uh, one organization so one organization recently tried to look at the uh, tried to measure the different approaches taken by countries such as um, the amount of uh, work hours um, required um, or the, the average work hours taken by people, the amount of leisure time and work-life balance, uh, access to green spaces and the amount of uh, mental health uh, public spending. And they found uh, with all of the factors considered, uh, there's also things such as uh, community safety. Um, they found that countries like Germany, Sweden and Finland lead in terms of mental wellbeing based on all these different factors. Um, interestingly, the, the English speaking world was much lower and there could be a couple of reasons for this. Um, it's interesting when you look at other indexes uh, looking at um, uh, such as a democrat democratic index by country. Uh, again, the Scandinavian countries and Northern European countries uh, largely lead in terms of uh, democratic uh, standards. Um, again, countries like Australia and the United Kingdom are also quite high, but it corroborates that the Nordic countries are leading in this. Um, and there's a bit of a correlation there with the mental health uh, outcomes. Uh, look at uh, civil liberties and human rights. Uh, again, Northern European and Nordic countries tend to do quite well. You can see here on the map with um, Australia and U UK in dark blue as well, uh, having similar human rights um, outcomes. However, that highlights that there are some mental health outcomes which aren't being addressed, which is other non-English speaking countries have, have uh, taken into account, such as work-life balance and so forth. If we were to dig a bit deeper and look at preventative measures. Obviously, one of the, the biggest parts of it is looking at um, mental well-being beginning in childhood. And um, obviously, one of the biggest influences upon childhood is what occurs within the home. So there needs to be early prevention and ensuring that within, that, within the household, social services are able to ensure that uh, things like child maltreatment are addressed 
So promotion at a communal le community level, the most common form of child abuse is emotional abuse followed by neglect. Uh, two thirds of reported child abuse is emotional abuse and neglect, neglect according to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. Uh, one in four children experience abuse and 78% of these experience neglect. Uh, it's quite heavy content here, but the um, neglect and emotional abuse, whilst common, can often occur alongside other types of abuse, compounding their effect. And this can be seen in uh, with neglect, with which other greater exposure to things like sexual and physical abuse can also occur. Uh, emotional abuse can also be intrinsically linked to neglect. Um, 71% of all of this maltreatment of children, which can obviously have severe impacts on mental well-being later on, uh, occurs from a biological parent. This includes all types of abuse. Um, all abuse types have high association with re-victimisation and PTSD symptom severity, as seen through the use of bivariate models. Uh, emotional abuse, despite uh, this, has um, the highest association through the use of multivariate models. Uh, there's some discrepancy here when we talk about um, how abuse is measured and the severity of abuse. Obviously, some abuse types are, of all types of abuse, are extreme, more extreme than others, so that can interfere with the ways in which uh, measurements are made. Uh, there can also be a huge discrepancy in social work reporting of abuse and what is claimed by those who make the claims indicating significant value of social workers. In many instances in reporting abuse claims, there is also significant lack of funding to social services to address and support disadvantaged social systems. Uh, statistics can lead, as mentioned, to oversimplified narratives, especially when, when some abuse isn't acknowledged, may also not indicate the severity of abuse or age of abuse in overall findings, which can link to severity of mental health uh, implications later on. Another factor of relevance, uh, animal abuse, uh, pet abuse, cruelty exposure by children uh, can, can exacerbate any PTSD um, this is relevant, this is re uh, recognising courts and family domestic violence cases, um, and it should be better uh, considered uh, within social services. Again, this reiterates how when dealing with uh, social wellbeing, it's not just humanity in isolation. In the same way, we need green spaces, other sentient beings, other animals are relevant to human wellbeing as well. Um, two factors that affect child wellbeing the most in terms of needing to be uh, looked at and and address uh, financial means within the family and the behavioural investment, which comes down to uh, care quality and quantity. Studies have shown that financial assistance in some context and competent guidance to families can be needed. This is to ensure that struggling families where there might be mental health issues, there might be drug and alcohol abuse, uh, that they uh, there might be trauma by the parents, that they are supported, facilitated to make sure that this isn't transferred to their children, also in other areas as modelling uh, competent, uh, if, there, if there's issues with, um, with the levels of care and quality of care provided. So both uh, in, uh, financial and behavioural uh, uh, investments need to be addressed. Um, mental health issues within family systems and the impact this can have on child wellbeing should be better promoted and understood within school systems and the community also. Um, on the other side of it, when we talk about the uh, overall impact of um, the implications of mental well-being into adulthood, uh, too often people with a mental disorder end up in prison. Uh, this is, it can include people with minor mental illnesses where uh, usually they might end up in, uh, in psychiatric facilities and all support, uh, supports, but uh, there's there can be an overlap and particularly with people with neurodevelopmental disorders, which isn't a mental, mental illness and therefore not able to be treated in the same way. Um, neuro, neurodevelopmental disorders are influenced by environment or can be influenced by the environment and things such as severe social deprivation and trauma, and so can therefore be prevented. Um, there are genetic factors behind some of them, but they can, for, for a large uh, portion, they can be prevented and can link to things like social deprivation and trauma. And thus given the percentages of 25%, 9% and 9% of attention deficit, autism and disorder and intellectual disability respectively within prison system inmates, um, of which large you know, significant percentages can be environmentally shaped through childhood, the focus on prevention through environmental influences and developmental uh, shaping and exposure to trauma or social, social deprivation is essential. Uh, the way corrective services operate is also essential to mental uh, um, 
well-being of society, uh, rehabilitation and low levels of uh, recidivism or repeat offences should be the goal of prison systems. Uh, we can see a stark contrast between highly effective systems in Scandinavia when recidivism is low and psychotherapeutic influences are significant compared to the United States where uh, re-offending is high and uh, psychotherapeutic culture is low. So examining the different approaches highlight complex factors such as historic factors and social welfare strategies and how these intersect with effective rehabilitation rates uh, along with the prison systems themselves. So the United States has a different history to Scandinavian countries, so this becomes relevant. Uh, criticisms of the effectiveness of approaches like cognitive behavioural therapy within prisons have been noted that only a modest decrease in crime rates occur with this approach. But what this criticism uh, misses is that it's not just in the specific therapies that result in rehabilitation, but a therapeutic prison environment which facilitates rehabilitation and therapy, which targets impulses associated with reoffending, meaning that this can decrease reoffending rates com you know, compared to where they aren't employed. Um, this highlights the importance of such therapeutic environments and approaches, but also highlights the value of, um, of earlier preventative measures, as, as we can see like in, in childhood and so forth. But um, uh, harsh US laws from the 1980s and 90s uh, undermine this effectiveness and for, for uh, changes to occur there, uh, some of those laws do need to be repealed as one study has, uh, uh, has advocated for. Um, it's not as simple as saying that um, uh, countries with strong social welfare or, or public spending uh, can mitigate mental health issues in contrast to the United States, which has limited public spending. A country like France also has significant uh, public spending to address mental health and is quite high in that regard, but there are significant human rights abuse issues in, in, in France and uh, by the, as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch um, acknowledge. Um, and you know, in the same way as with America within judicial context and so forth, uh, and for disadvantaged people. So it's not as simple as that. So what it comes down to is it's the case of uh, preserving human rights in conjunction with social welfare. So the disadvantaged people, people who are on the bottom of society, who uh, where there's trauma as existence and so forth, uh, minority groups, uh, immigrants and so forth, uh, people who, uh, where there's fi less financial means, uh, that they are supported and it's not just um, strong public spending for the majority and whilst uh, some people uh, continue intergenerational issues with, with mental health issues. Uh, so when we see in, in Scandinavia, we can also see that in Germany, which is also a powerful country, it's, so it's not just limited to smaller uh, countries. We can see that with countries with, with strong economies, but having this um, public spending and, and, and preventative measures can be effective. And it doesn't mean that you're a weak uh, economy as a consequence. But this, this can uh, act as an example in contrast to the approach taken by the United States and the lack of uh, social welfare focuses. Um, yeah, so in, in conclusion, yeah, through, through strengthening prevention, preventative approaches and influencing cultural mores to highlight that mental wellbeing as a priority, it can surely be better enabled. Um, closing remarks, yeah, mental health underpins so much of a thrivable society and preventative measures can allow a society to be thrivable. Uh, thank you all for coming.